Welcome to another episode of the Fashion Masters Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about kind of the entire subject around weight management, size and shape, fat loss, that kind of realm. And we have very interesting perspectives and we see that it's a little bit more complex than how the typical fitness industry, I would say, would address how to lose fat and or how to just lose weight. But primarily when you're wanting to lose weight, you're wanting to lose fat. But we're going to talk about a lot of different perspectives that we have. It's really cool because you're the fashion decompression, fashion master expert, and you view things from your perspective. And I agree with definitely vast majority of them, if not all of them. But I also have been in the fitness industry for a decade, if not longer. And I also can get kind of pulled into their thoughts. And then I try to balance between both of them. So it's going to be a really interesting and fun discussion. So let's kind of start off. Deanna, when somebody is to either ask you about your perspective on what, what would you even say? Fat loss, weight loss, or size and shape? How do you like to identify even this category? I prefer managing size and shape because um, a couple of things. So back when I was in my 20s and I was 50 pounds overweight, first of all, the typical rules of weight loss didn't apply to me. I was decreasing calories. I was working out like a fiend. And actually, I was getting bigger. So right off the hop, that you know was challenging for me because it's not like I'm sitting on the couch just eating chips all day and getting bigger. I'm actually doing the work as an athletic therapist as well, trained to do, to be fit. Yet the more that I worked, the bigger that I got. So, you know, I was in the gym, I was doing weights, I was doing stair climbers, I was doing Thai bow, I was running aerobics. I tried absolutely everything. And, you know, in the mindset that if you have increased muscle mass, then your metabolism increases. I mean, all these things that I was learning along the way made sense. However, it didn't actually work for me. And and you're also talking primarily about calories in versus calories out. If you are burning more calories than you take in, you should be following the rules of weight loss yes. and losing weight, if not primarily fat. Yes, exactly. And then when it was when I started the practice of yoga, actually, and I had a really wonderful teacher and about every 30 seconds or so, she would remind us to breathe. And I recognized, wow, every time she reminds us to breathe, I'm actually not breathing. So that became a fundamental understanding that I had. And right around that same time, it was like all these things happened to me at the same time. I had that moment when I dove my hand into my abdomen when I was having the, that anxiety attack. So this was really when I started tying it all together because now here I am. I never touched that area of my body because that was where I stored so much of that weight and I was ashamed of it and I didn't like it. So I just avoided it. Now I'm diving in. Mm. First thing I encounter is pain. Pain brings me back to the ground. I'm I know I'm breathing, but then as I start exploring in the tissue, I felt with I, I felt with my fingers what felt like scar tissue, even though I hadn't had any injury or surgery in that area. So suddenly I'm recognizing like, no wonder when I'm coming home from a five mile run dripping wet with sweat, my belly would still feel cold. And I realized this is why as much as the work that I'm doing, I'm not getting any blood flow mm. to this area of my body. And it was literally after that second day of me spending maybe 30, 45 minutes with my hands in the tissue, just intuitively moving it around. When I stood up, my belly looked flatter than it had looked in years. Mm. And I mean, if you can just imagine like, you know, how that would have felt, right? Like after years of working so hard and actually compressing and ballooning further from the work and suddenly, holy smokes, so this became my daily process. And this is a really interesting point because you just said that after you worked in your belly for 45 minutes, the first time you noticed the biggest change in your belly and you looked, correct me if I'm wrong, smaller. So you may not have actually lost fat or lost weight, but your size and shape change. And I think that's what a lot of people care about. They don't care about necessarily, oh, I have... 36% body fat. Now I have 18 or whatever it is. It's how do you actually look? Because we're also going to talk about posture. If you have terrible posture, that can contribute to how you look. And maybe you might look bigger than you would if you were to correct your posture. And it's not just about how you look, but it's also about how you feel. Because when there's all this compression, we become toxic. We're bloated. We're stagnant. Things aren't moving properly. So you feel congested 
Like, you know how you feel when you have a stuffy nose, right? Like it doesn't feel good. Same with the belly. Like if you've got a stuffy belly, you know, it doesn't feel good because you don't have ease of flow. So um, yeah. So anyways, and what's interesting to that point is prior to that, I was addicted to the scale. Every day I would get up, I'd stand on the scale. If I was a pound up, my day was ruined. If I was a pound down, I had a good, like, it was crazy. And then if you're a pound up, then you get into that self-sabotage because you're stressed. So now you're stress eating. And then like, it's, it's amazing how your mind will get caught into this stuff. So somewhere along the way, I was smart enough to say, I'm getting rid of the scale because it's not helping me. But about, I don't know, a couple months after I started this work on myself, I had gone down a size in my pants. I was feeling better. So I'm like, hey, I want to see how much weight I've lost. And I hadn't lost any. This is the That's number on the crazy. scale hadn't changed, even though my body had changed remarkably. Wow. Now, since that moment, yes, my weight has changed over years. However, the, when I talk about managing your body in this regard, I like to talk about managing your size and shape. Space gain, size loss. So my question is, what made you change your size and shape? So you talked about, like, I know the answer to this, but yes. I want you to explain this. So what did you do to actually change your shape, your appearance and your pant size? So, and it's understanding fascia decompression. Now at the beginning, I didn't really know all the components like I understand them now, but what I, what I have recognized is of course, as we get older, we get shorter and wider. And again, if I was actively making myself shorter and wider by working out so so hard. You know, I remember I remember this one moment where I'm like, okay, I'm determined I'm going to get smaller. So I decided to go to the gym and I said, five days a week, I'm going to do the stair climber, 45 minutes. And I was going high intensity. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'd be done and I'm just drenched. So I had a pair of jeans that were a little tight before I started. And I'm like, I'm going to get into these jeans. Mm -hmm. And I remember after, you know, that period of time I gave myself, I was excited to put them on. They were tighter. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what is going on? But I built all this muscle, mm -hmm. this muscle mass. So I just got bigger, which was yeah. so not my intention. Right. Yeah. So anyway, what I've come to understand is when we compress, we balloon because again, every cell in the body has a space that is appropriate for it to be in. So you just moved into a new space. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you didn't have anything positioned where it was supposed to be, you would simply have clutter. Mm -hmm. And then you put the you know pictures on the walls, you've got everything in its place. Now you have room to roam around and you've got space. So that's kind of what happens in the body when we're not conscious of that posture and alignment, gravity wins and we start compressing. So as I become shorter, I get wider. And you know, as people typically get over 40, they might not change anything from their diet or exercise yet. Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit of a bulge in my belly or you know, just these things start to happen. And what is the determining factor? It's gravity. We're constantly getting compressed. We're becoming shorter as time goes on, unless we're fully conscious of that proper diaphragmatic breath because the exhalation, and this will be a fun conversation because there's so much more information mm -hmm. coming out about it. But when we exhale, we're lifting against the force of gravity. It's that counter force. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if gravity is constantly pulling us down, we have something in our body to maintain our uprightedness and it's that full exhale. So when we start to really engage that breath, that is that counter force to gravity. So we can continue to go through time without gravity adding up in our tissue, compressing us. And then basically we compress and we balloon. Mm. And not only are we compressing and ballooning where there's congestion and a lack of flow, now there's more inflammation that adds weight on the scale. That congestion is gonna create an acidic environment that's going to attract parasites, bacteria, fungus, they have waste that adds more weight on the scale. It also adds more size in the body. So when we can understand how to decompress by putting not only pressure into the body intentionally over time to create heat on the external areas as we do, but also activating that proper diaphragmatic breath. Now we're heating the body from the inside and the outside so we can effectively melt those adhesions that formed as we started falling off balance. And start to like lift all of the trapped garbage toxicity so that it can effectively be removed from the body. And what's interesting, like you taught me this when I first started working with you, there's only two times in your life when you actually accumulate fat cells, 
when you're baby and when you go through when you're a baby and when you go through puberty. I've also heard other people say it's literally only when you're a baby. But regardless of what the answer is, after a certain time, you're not actually gaining more fat cells. The fat cells are just getting larger. Yes. And you talk a lot about how compression adds to that poor breathing, poor posture, toxicity buildup. So whenever somebody notices, let's say you're 32 and then you just gain 15 pounds, let's call it fat or ballooning, whatever we really want to refer it to as, it's not that you've added more fat cells to your body. They're already there. They're just ballooning and they're ballooning for a specific reason. Now, what's that reason? Sure, you could say diet plays a role, but there's so much that plays a role. It can be your posture. How effective and efficient is your breath, your posture? The more that I'm reading that breath book, and I know we're going to have like a, an episode specifically on that, it blows me away because it just validifies more that 84, they actually said 85% of weight loss comes through the exhalation phase of the breath. It's removed from carbon dioxide. And then the rest is through like sweating, um, maybe tears, like that kind of stuff, going to the washroom, whatever. But that's just remarkable within itself, just understanding that stat. So point being is people aren't accumulating more fat cells. They are simply becoming more toxic and ballooning. They are getting bigger because there's a pressure buildup and there's something in your body that it doesn't like and it's kind of clinging on to it because it's toxic and we have to find a efficient and effective protocols to start cleansing. It's really cleansing your body, cleansing your cells so that you can lose, we'll call it that weight or that waste trapped waste. in the fat cell. Yeah, it really all comes down to flow. Again, as long as we have optimal space, we have optimal flow. So things come into the body and then they leave the body um, properly. If we don't have that optimal space though, and and we can we can easily understand it in the abdominal area because again, most people slouch. So if you're sitting up nice and tall and you know you're you're aligned, your belly is likely fairly flat. You probably, if you're a woman, especially have a bit of an hourglass figure. But you know now slouch and allow the weight of the rib cage to come in. I mean, put your hands on your belly and just do that. It's the mm. tissue's got to go somewhere yeah. and it's not going to go in. <laughs> There's no yeah. room for it to go inside. So it's going to start yeah. going outward, but then we can start to translate that to, I mean, knee fat, for example, a lot of people end up having knee fat on the top of the knee or that inner knee fat, and they think it's fat, but it's not. So when we stand hyperextended at the knees, which most people do, we've now lost the floor for that tissue. So it starts to sag and hang. Same as if we're pronating, you know, the, the way that the knee joint is now, instead of having that knee joint nice and level and balanced, it compresses on one side and it's going to balloon on the other side. And often it's going to be compressing on that outer side, ballooning on that inner side. So it looks like we have knee fat and you can actually feel it and grab it, but it's not just fat. It's everything in yeah. that space, including yeah. the toxins, mm -hmm. you know, that are also trapped in there, making that tissue uh, larger. Mm -hmm. So when we understand that, we can take a very different approach to how we handle our size and shape. Because if you're, if you're doing it through dieting and you're not getting the results like I wasn't, and not to say, of course, I mean, we want to eat clean because the more, the more garbage you put in your body, the more your body becomes toxic and then has to deal with that. So the cleaner we can eat, of course, that is only going to benefit our size and shape. Mm -hmm. But you can be eating really clean. And if you're compressed and you're ballooned, you're still going to have that ballooning. And similar to you can be eating really unhealthy, but if you are, you have good posture, you have good breathing habits, your metabolism is fast, like then you could stay very lean. You could have a very low body fat. And I know lots of people that are like that and sure they're blessed with maybe like a quick metabolism and that could have been hereditary and good on you, but you're, you're not healthy and, and size and shape doesn't determine your health either. Sure. It can definitely account to it, but some people just naturally are going to have hold on to a little bit more weight than others. And I think that's also okay. Not everybody needs to be at 12% body fat to be healthy. I think that's a major misconception, but you also got, if you're doing all the right things and all the right protocols, you're going to be at your healthy weight. And I think that's a really big, big thing that people need to understand is find the weight that makes you happy and is good for you because 
I, I just naturally am lean. I always have been. You've known me my entire life. And I can try to gain more fat, but it's very difficult. And sure, some might say I'm blessed with really good genetics, but it's also more challenging for me to put on, let's say, muscle because my metabolism is so fast. But anyways, I think that's an important note that people need to understand that don't just look at people on a magazine and be like, I want to look like that. If I don't look like that, I'm sad or I'm not happy with my body. You have to be in love with your body and understand that first to be able to get to your healthy weight, your healthy size and shape. But I, I also think it's the proportion of where things are held. So you might have really skinny legs or, you know, mm -hmm. I don't even like that word skinny, but you know what I mean? Um, in comparison to your upper body. Mm -hmm. So that may be the case. And then suddenly you have this like really ballooned belly. And so that's not a good thing because the ballooning tells us a whole bunch of things. It tells us the stress to the heart. Because as soon as we start falling in here, now we're putting stress on the heart. We're taking away space in the aorta. So the heart has to work harder. We're putting a ton of pressure on the stomach organ. So if we're not breathing properly, that's going to get compressed. We might end up with leaky gut. We might have metabolic disorders because the pancreas isn't working properly. We might have fatty liver disease because the um, it, it's clogged and, and frozen with fats that are cold. So it's also that that we really want to look at. But I mean, even talking about metabolism, it's common to believe that as we get older, our metabolism slows down. Mm -hmm. But why is that? It's because as we get older, we succumb to gravity. We create adhesions throughout the entire body. Our cells that are, when we're younger, hungry and active participants in our body are getting shut down and shut off. So now there's less hungry mouths slowing down that metabolism. So as we start going through the body in the opposite direction and decompressing the fascia, now we start waking up those cells that were previously blocked. So metabolism increases. And also like toxicity, like people gen typically become more toxic as or accumulate more toxins as time goes on because people don't know how to effectively detoxify the body. And that could also in part contribute to a slower metabolism. For sure. I mean, anything that's getting in the way of flow is going to be a problem for our health. Yeah. And that's really what dis-ease is. It's a lack of optimal flow in the body. So whether we're looking at pain or if you do have some kind of label to some dysfunction in your body or you're looking at your size and your shape, it all really comes down to flow. Because if things are flowing properly and everything is as it should be in position, nothing, nothing stays. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got what the body needs and then we release what it doesn't. And we just have this continuous cycle going through us. And I love that. I, let, let's hold on to this subject for a bit. Because that's so important. That's the first thing you noticed with your physical appearance was decompressing and then sure, maybe activating and accessing more of your diaphragm so that you're breathing more effectively. People, I th okay, we all need to understand that our connective tissue holds our body together. If our connective tissue, primarily we're talking about our fascia, if that is compressed, dry, sticky, it's full of just gunk. <laughs> Pretty much. That's more of a, an appropriate word than what I was going to say. Um, then there's literally a physical barricade to allow the oxygen to get distributed to the cell and to remove the carbon dioxide and the waste effectively away from the cell. There's a physical barricade. We are blocked. When you decompress, you awaken the body and you allow that flow to be efficient. That's a really simple way to explain it. So that alone people in our community have noticed incredible changes. They do not change their exercise regime. They do not change their, their diet, but they do block therapy and they do de fascia decompression. And then we also teach proper breathing, how to access the diaphragm. There's a lady, we mentioned this on the other podcast. One lady mentioned in our community, she lost how much? It was like a hundred and some pounds. It was like wild. Like pounds. it was crazy the number, which again, isn't the typical, first of all. A hundred percent. But I mean, the fact that that was the case was just like, wow. I mean, holy smokes. <laughs> and that's what she said. That's not our words. That's her words. And that's incredible. And there's... Now on the, on the flip side of that too, though, there are people, and it's interesting because I've had the opportunity to connect with a couple of them, a couple of teachers who also have been doing a ton of blocking 
and yet their body hadn't changed. So, okay, why? So looking at what's going on, it's because of that holding pattern in the calves and the feet. So I've been working closely with one of them for the last few months and we're starting to this finally- is This is recent, yes. And we're starting to finally see some changes happening, but the amount of freeze in the lower body, in those ankles, in the foot, what was going on, like you could tell it was like the Arctic down there. So all of the work that was happening throughout the rest of the body, as soon as you start walking, you get pulled back into that negative pattern in the calves and the feet. And that pulls the body forward and it pulls you into that compression again and that congestion. So certain bodies are going to respond really quickly to this work. Other bodies really need to look at where are these holding patterns because that's going to be the thing. And I mean, it's, it's just fascinating because, um, and I'm sure it's frustrating too for some people because they're like, wow, like, you know, all these people are sharing these positive benefits yet. And sometimes we can even feel like we're getting a little bigger at times initially, because as we start getting rid of those toxins that are deeper through the layers of tissue, now they start coming up and coming into the body to be acknowledged and to be released. But if we also have a liver that's congested, you know, things can take a little time and then you might feel a little bloated mm -hmm. for a while until things catch up and we start totally. to heat the body. So is a body in a pretty healthy state from the um, perspective of temperature or is it in a deep freeze? Because the more frozen your body, the longer it's going to take to start seeing those benefits. Mm. And, and that's just the reality is some people simply are literally in a deep freeze in their tissue. And we were chatting about this the other day. So we were chatting about the breath book and why carbon dioxide is actually very important to have an equal balance in our blood because it's like the oxygen gets sent in and then the carbon dioxide, you're explaining this to me, correct me if I'm wrong, it allows to open it up, the hemoglobin, so that the oxygen can actually be delivered. So you need a balance of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood and that comes down to having a fairly balanced breath. They say five and a half seconds in, five and a half seconds out is they, they quoted in the breath book the perfect breath. And there's also other tools and ways that you can access your breath for certain benefits. But the point I'm trying to get at is when some people are so frozen and locked in their legs, let's talk primarily their calves and their feet, mm -hmm. then you're not allowed allowed to effectively travel to those extremities to allow the car the oxygen then the carbon dioxide to open up the gateway for the oxygen to enter in which could also affect the perspective of fat loss or weight loss absolutely accurate yes no totally because again if you think about um wh when i look at these bodies and you see the feet so first of all let's just talk about the feet because we've, we've talked quite a bit about the feet but these incredible dynamic structures that carry the weight of everything above. I mean, when you look at the size of your foot and you think about how much weight these things are carrying mm -hmm. and there's 26 bones and, you know, all of the different landscapes and, and uh, things that the foot is capable of doing, but we don't yet pay attention to the feet really, right? So over a lifetime of unconscious living, the feet essentially pancake. And because they do that and they start falling away from balance, the fascia starts migrating to support this crazy structure that we no longer are conscious of. And when you mean pancake, do you mean like collapse, your like a arch, flat tire? Yeah, your so, arch is collapsing because a lot of people have really compressed feet because of like the, our shoes and being in yep. high heels. But you mean the arch is really collapsing in, and then they're externally rotating the foot. Yeah, often. I mean, like there, there's a lot of different variations depending on what we're doing. But um, typically when I look at the body, I look at what, what foot is the driver or the flat tire? What's the, like I think of driving with a flat tire, things get pulled into right. that area, right? Yeah. So one foot's going to be drawing away. It does tend to be the, the flatter foot. And then the other side of the body anchors, and that would tend to be the foot that's a little tighter because mm -hmm. we're not symmetrical. We don't just like flatten symmetrically yeah. like there's, a pull and a response all the time in the body. So the way that the collagen component of the fascia ends up having to migrate, that's the adhesion is collagen is adhesion. So, um, and collagen is the building blocks, but without the elastin, it's scar tissue essentially, right? So it's the slow migration of the collagen away from balance to create these building blocks. So I don't literally fall flat on my face because I've got this force tipping 
So we've get we've got again like this body always responding. I was thinking the other day I was I was lying in bed and I'm trying to think all the time of like what are some other good analogies to explain how this happens and then suddenly I'm thinking of a sailboat. You know like what what is there on a sailboat when you've got the wind pulling a sail like how do you stop the boat from tipping over? You need a counterbalance on the other side. Mm. Um, and they use keels or I, I'm not even going to, I'm not a sailor. I'm not even going to go there, <laughs> but either way there, there's ways of yeah. balancing, right? Right. So this is what the body unconsciously does is it balances and that that's a migration of the collagen. And then, I mean, you can see it in a face. This is what happens to faces as we get older or to that, what we think is knee fat. Like you don't stand with a proper foundation. You've got saggy skin because the collagen is migrated. So now you just have this elastic without structure and it starts right. to hang because gravity is going to be pulling it down. So you see it in the jowls, you see it wherever, but I mean, this is the response of what happens over time as we age. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> I uh, veered I, so I was, far away. <laughs> you no, know, that's like, you're talking about the flat tire right. and like the anchoring, um, and talking primarily about if you're so compressed and frozen in the lower legs and the feet in the feet, then that can be difficult to exhale all that carbon dioxide out that's what we're talking trapped. about yes yes so now we have these adhesions blocking flow to these cells and these cells aren't working for you until we actually put energy into them they're not working so now the carbon dioxide comes from the cell from activity if the cell isn't functioning there's no carbon dioxide to actually say hey like magnetically to the oxygen come over here give me the oxygen so i can like exchange right so yeah areas that were that were frozen where we don't have mobility we have cells not basically doing anything mm -hmm. so they're not giving away that waste to then say here's the exchange for the oxygen right so that's why we need to address the adhesions we need to melt through those adhesions to allow those cells and, and also posturally shift, right? So mm -hmm. that this is a big piece. And that's why all that work between the toes, we're seeing so many people have these incredible benefits by working between the toes for three yeah. minutes, because now you're bringing life into the toes and then that's going to change your gait. And then as you start changing your gait, that's going to make cells wake up. And then you're going to be drawing more oxygen to these cells, taking more carbon dioxide away. And now your system is becoming more efficient. And that's the beautiful piece with that exhale, because when we exhale and we hold that nice, slow exhale, think of what's happening to the lungs here. So when we inhale, first of all, again, this plate of muscle moves down. When we exhale, it lifts. If we're just doing these really shallow upper chest breaths, we're not really lifting. And when we lift that muscle and we allow it to make contact with the base of the lungs, which is where, again, the majority of those oxygen receptor sites re reside, mm -hmm. then we're actually assisting it yep. mechanically. And that's the funny part. People don't really look at the inner mechanics of the body. You know, they, they look more at the physiology or the chemistry or, or whatever happens between cells, all the interactions. But mechanics are so incredibly important. I mean, just the fact of digestion. You know, if we're breathing properly, there's a mechanical aspect from that breath that is occurring to create energy and heat to that organ to do its job properly. Yeah. And that was even stated in the breath book. Like he was saying, when he breathed diaphragmatically, the diaphragm is there to massage your abdominal organs and even reach the heart and the lungs. Yeah. Like it's supposed to create that movement and that internal massage with every breath that you're taking. Yeah, and I mean, again, think about this like tube, right? This this like aorta, now your heart is working. If I'm slouched and I'm compressed, now there's not that much- There's room. high blood pressure. There's high blood pressure, or there's yeah. a valve not getting, not, not properly connecting because you're squishing something and mm -hmm. things aren't sitting as they mm -hmm. should, so they don't function as they mm -hmm. should. Very, very interesting. So like, when we were talking about the calves and the feet and there's not enough flow there, but you awaken it, then we're allowed to have that exchange essentially of taking the carbon dioxide out, putting the carbon dioxide in, and then 84, 85% of weight loss comes through the exhalation phase via carbon dioxide out of the body. So we're now able to actually awaken all of these cells and start to have that exchange working on an every moment basis or it's an every yeah. minute basis i guess because that's how long it takes for the blood to circulate through the entire body approximately so this is where the idea and i think it's important that we address this in a little bit more detail but the whole world 
fitness industry, I should say. I won't say the whole world, but what I hear everywhere, this is what I hear everywhere is you need to burn more calories than you take in. That is just the absolute only way that you can lose weight. And when I hear that, I'm really trying to understand that perspective because I just know it doesn't work for a lot of people. Like it seriously does not work for a lot of people. And for many people it will, and that's great. So would you kind of agree that if we started implementing proper posture, proper breathing, healthy eating habits, then that statement would be true? For sure, it's going to be true for some. So for me, it wasn't true, probably because my liver was so backed up that my body was, and, and because I was so frozen in my breath, you know, I was a stress mess. Like I was an absolute stress mess. I, I probably, you know, was breathing 10%, if not less than my potential capacity. So my body was simply in a deep freeze. And I remember I was, I mean, and part of it was because I had eating disorders and all of these other things. But, you know, I remember going through this like starving, um, binging process. It was horrible where, you know, I would, from Sunday till Thursday, I would live on diet Coke. Okay. Like now we know what that does, but I mean, back then I'm thinking, okay. And I would drink <laughs> liters and liters and liters a day because it's like zero calories. And it's like, but yet think about the amount of it's stuff. A lot of caffeine too. It's well, but, it, and a lot of chemical. Oh yeah. So, I mean, your body is still having to deal with it, whether it has a calorie number or not, your yeah. body still has to figure out what am I doing with a hundred percent, all of this stuff that's going in. So but then I would hit the weekend and I'm, I'm in university and it was party times and you're drinking and you're eating shit, bad food, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're eating crappy food. And in the beginning, the periods of starvation actually resulted in me being able to drop a little bit and then I'd have my binge time and then it would increase. But then I got to a point where from that Sunday to Thursday, there was no change on the scale. I was eating nothing and there was no changing on the scale. And then eventually, I mean, my system just became so completely frozen and toxic and messed up that, you know, here I was. And then boom, fortunately, this moment happened for me so that I could start actually moving those toxins out of the body as I started to understand the breath. This, okay, this is a perfect time to mention this because I was listening to Gary Brecka's podcast. It was either his podcast or he was a guest on a podcast and I... I don't know who this celebrity was, but I think he's around 400 pounds and he wants to bring him to, I, I think like, um, don't quote me on this. I think it was 190 pounds or maybe 210 pounds, or it was like essentially losing nearly 200 pounds, losing 200 pounds of let's call it fat is not as simple as people think. And there's a lot of many other considerations you need to take the amount of toxicity he was talking about that's going to be dumped into his bloodstream, his body wouldn't be able to handle handle it on how fast Gary's trying to get him to lose this weight. I forget. He might've said like within a year or something, he's going to lose nearly 200 pounds, which is absolutely insane that he can do that. And he's a brilliant guy. So he knows really what he's doing from um, like a biohacking perspective. Yeah. So I think the point here is if you're wanting to drop 20 pounds, 10 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, you have to be careful because you need to be able to detoxify at the rate that you're losing the weight. And it's also going to be an exchange. It's They're going to complement each other. The more you detoxify, the more you're going to allow your body to actually lose that weight, lose that fat. So I guess point being here is you need to detoxify if you're wanting to lose weight, whether it's the sole idea to lose weight because you can't just dump all of these toxins into your bloodstream at once. You can get extremely, extremely sick by doing that. So that's why I think there's a lot of things to consider and take into consideration when you are trying to lose weight. And that comes, your breath is a phenomenal way to detoxify your body. It's probably one of the most efficient ways to detoxify the body. Proper foods, the kind of water you're drinking, fascia decompression, but also when you're doing fascia decompression, you can be opening up areas of garbage and that can be dumped into your bloodstream and you have to detoxify that. However, primarily through the, through the breath, through proper eating, etc. So there's a lot of these considerations, um, that we need to take, but that's just also an interesting perspective that he said. 
Well, and I recently was on a summit with Laura Frontiero, and she lives in the world of parasites and said the same thing. You can't just take a parasite cleanse if your body is toxic and doesn't have flow because then you dump these into your system. And if you don't have the ability to get rid of them effectively, mm. you can become more sick. Mm -hmm. So everything is like that. I mean, even with blocking, you know, if you've had... If you've had a, a really um, congested liver because maybe you've been taking meds like for decades and then you start working your body, like we all have to find our own pace and our own ability to be able to manage what's going on because we're all different and we're all starting from different places. I mean, maybe you as a child at the age of four had some traumatic event which froze your breath and you grew from that point compared to somebody else that, you know, lived a, a really great young life with you know, not a lot of stress, like these, all of these things matter and they add up to be, this is what my body is today. So we are all the same from the perspective of we are under this force of gravity and we are going to be compressing to some degree as time goes on. That's basically what age is, is compression, but how we compress and what areas of the body become stuck and stagnant as we compress, that's going to be a very different story for each and every one of us. And that's why we have to use our intuition. We have to become our own healthcare advocates. We have to recognize that just because we try one thing, that one thing might not be enough. We might need to yeah. do 10 things in order to bring our body from the place that it is back to balance and health because we have like, it, it's that it's, it's, this is the environment, right? I mean, I, I do like the terrain theory because I mean, this is a terrain. It's no different than a city. If you've got a city with clean water and lots of good farming and re regenerative farming and you know like you've got clean roads and you don't have a lot of crime that's going to be very different than a city where you have the opposite of that and then what does that look like so the people in the city that don't have a healthy city are going to be very different than the people in the healthy city so these terrains of ours what family did we mm. come from was it a toxic family did we have good relationships all these things are going to affect how we breathe and how we breathe is going to affect every aspect of our being mm. Wow. There's, there's so much to consider and that's why it can be very frustrating. I'm not going to say it like personally bothers me anymore, but when I just hear how many people say, and will literally call other people pretty rude names, if they don't agree that you need to burn more calories than you take in. So sure that can work, that can help. I'm not disagreeing with that, but what we just stated, there are so many other things to take into consideration. Well, and when we already know, because this, again, it, they, they said it again in the breath book. We heard it years ago. It was in that medical news, that study in 2014, 84% of weight loss comes through proper exhalation. So you can be like me starving yourself, but I wasn't breathing. So there was no there was no weight loss. Or how he said in the breath book, you could have been over breathing. Or you could have and, been over breathing, right. And that over breathing means <sighs> Yeah. That because that's not breath. that's not that's not breathing in a way where there's an exchange of that carbon dioxide 100%, and oxygen. A hundred percent. Yeah. And this is something that everybody can start doing now. Um, I think first great thing to do is the belly position on our YouTube channel, for, obviously for free. You grab your rolled up towel, we teach you how to decompress the belly, access more of the diaphragm, but then also to breathe really slowly. Mm -hmm. They said the slower you breathe, the more oxygen absorption you will get into the body and the more carbon dioxide you will rid out of the body. So if that's five and a half seconds in, five and a half seconds out, they said that's fairly optimal. You're going to say something. But I also like, that's why we share exhale longer than you inhale because we know how to easily take an in-breath. Right. We don't know how to easily yeah. exhale properly and really give that impetus to squeeze the belly small and to activate those muscles. Breathing alone when, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced it. You're lying on your back and you're doing breathing exercises and you work up a sweat. Oh God, yeah. Especially when you focus on that exhale and then you Big hold time. before inhaling. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's work and like, so we don't have to be moving our physical bodies around in a space to be exercising. Yeah. Just focus on exhaling and see how you start to feel the energy down into your legs and your, and your arms. And again, just how much heat you can generate in your body by, you know, holding for a few moments before engaging that inhale and then 
challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I know, I remember you told me like how long you could, you know, hold your breath for, but also like, I'll try to challenge myself and say, okay, I mean, and I can do it. I can exhale for a full minute before engaging the inhale. And that takes time because again, like anything, it's a muscle and the stronger the muscle gets, um, you know, the stronger it becomes. Um, But that's the thing. The more we can move that stuff out, then we've created that many more hungry cells, right? Because now we're actually using muscles in the core that we normally wouldn't be using. Like to, yeah. to exhale fully, to squeeze that belly small. Well, and that's creating, like that's 100% exercise. It's cre- like then, then you just have to look at what determines exercise. Is going for a slow walk considered exercise or does it have to be considered high intensity by doing all of this. But what about if you're running up a hill and you're breathing through those muscles of the upper chest, you're not engaging the diaphragm. hundred percent. What exercise is going to be more beneficial for you? Totally. And like, the, these are the kind of studies I really want us to do in the future when we have more access to this. Like that would be really cool to determine because you don't need to do all this crazy stuff. Now I like to do the crazy stuff, but I also know how to breathe and I don't do all this crazy stuff all the time. I go through phases like we all do, but So other than what I mentioned about doing the belly position, what I want people to really, really grasp and understand here is if you can exhale for again, the six counts, and then we'll say inhale four counts, that might be very challenging to start. Even if you can do three seconds in, three seconds out, that's going to be... But you pace it yourself. I mean, you can count to six quickly and and to four quickly. It's it's just make the... Sorry. Yeah. Make the exhale longer than the inhale yes, is the yeah. point. And breathing in and out through the nose. Yes. It's amazing how important that is too. And they they explained all in the breath book how they clogged their nose up and they were... It's unbelievable how much their health changed mm-hmm. from mouth breathing for... I think it was only like 10 days. Yeah, it was like, 10 days. Like, And it was, it was crazy. I mean, it was like... I remember there was a documentary of a, a gentleman who was a health expert who decided for one month was only going to eat McDonald's and how much... His health. Oh, supersize me. Yes, yes. And how quickly wow, his body went there. from like, you know, being really healthy to completely not. Yeah. He was able to get himself back quickly because he knew yeah. what to do. Same with these guys though. After the only the mouth breathing, within 10 days, then they went to the nose breathing. And I mean, the blood pressure, the blood chem, whatever tests that they did, yeah. they improved very quickly as yeah. well. Yeah, it was remarkable. Um, another thing I want to mention, because I, I did mention this on my YouTube channel before, and, and this is cool. I think this is just another good tip that people can do because it's not necessarily something we would directly say, but it's that 30, 30, 30 rule. It's just, it's just really cool because this also changes the perspective of weight loss to fat loss. The idea is we want to lose fat if we want to just call it that or the ballooning of the fat cells. So he says, Within 30 minutes of waking, have 30 grams of protein followed by 30 minutes of steady state cardio, meaning you're walking, you're still fairly relaxed, you can have a conversation with someone and that's going to actually start triggering the fat to be burned because initially what we're doing, let's say you just wake up and do fasted cardio and that's a big thing nowadays. I'm going to wake up first thing, I'm going to do steady state cardio for 30 minutes or an hour, go for a big jog. And Hey, if if you love doing that and it makes you feel great by all means, but he's saying for the sole purpose of losing fat, you need to have that protein within 30 minutes and then do the 30 minutes of steady state cardio because you first burn through the glycogen and the carbs in your blood and through your muscles with that might take a few minutes, but then it starts to revert to the fat and then you start burning the fat. Whereas if you didn't have the protein and you don't have those amino acids in your blood, then you start actually burning your muscle. So people think that they're burning all this fat and doing all this good stuff, but you're actually burning muscle. Then your body has to rebuild that muscle throughout the day and then you do it all over again. So that's why a lot of people aren't burning the fat according to Gary Brecker. And this is why I never get into these topics because then you look at the (laughs) intermittent fasting and that's a whole different science, right? And I personally like the intermittent fasting. And also when I was learning about different body types, uh, for women, there's four, for men, there's three. Um, So I'm an adrenal body type and the adrenal body type is the only one that you actually shouldn't start your day with that protein. If I had bacon and eggs Mm. for breakfast, um, my metabolism doesn't actually start kicking in until later. I am the person that, you know, I could do the coffee and the donut, unlike the thyroid body type that would make them crazy, right? Right. So 
I mean, there, there's so many variables and that's why I stay away from that because I mean, and I, and I love that you brought that up because there's even compl complexity to what he stated there. Yeah. There's, there's complexity to all this because we're all unique and individual. And that's why everybody's weight loss journey can't just be a blanket statement saying burn more calories than you take in. It's, it's becoming more and more ridiculous, even just us having this conversation because there's going to be a lot of things you need to try. You have to be patient with it. You've got to test different foods as well. Like, and I think the woman's body is different from, I mean, Mindy Pels 100%. has, you know, the fasting like a girl. I was on her summit. She's got an amazing book. Um, you know, she's about the cold plunging, but also the fasting, especially as you're going through menopause. So, I mean, that that's just it. Like there's, there's so many differences mm -hmm. in men and women and what age are you and, and what are your mm -hmm. goals and all of these different things. But at the end of the day, if you're not breathing, and if you've got adhesions in your body, you're going to have a system that's going to be slower and congested and inflammation in itself. Like I remember years ago, and this was really helpful because I had experienced it where, you know, it's Thanksgiving weekend and three days in a row, there's family dinners of turkey and wine and stuffing and dessert. And you compile that. And then like you're 10 pounds heavier on the other side of a weekend. And I remember hearing it's impossible to loot, to gain 10 pounds yeah. of fat, but it's yeah. inflammation, right? Because I, like, I was wanting to make that point. Glad yeah. Because I, like, so, so, okay. If you don't understand that, no, you're, though, you're just like, oh my gosh, like I've literally gained 10 pounds in mm -hmm. three days. How is that humanly possible? But when you get that it's inflammation and then you know what to do with that. Inflammation, water retention, all that stuff. When you're eating a definitely just sure we could say more calories, higher fat, like, but it's primarily a lot of the sodium plus all the excess calories plus being dehydrated. Your body's going to want to really cling on to that water, really cling on to it. Same with that inflammation, because now you just irritated your body. You just gave it a shock and it's clinging on to it. The thing is too, I eat a ton of fats. I mean, like I'll have like, you know, two tablespoons of that really oh, and I'm good not saying, olive oil. I'm not saying that fat No, no, is I'm just saying, cause. but, but I mean, if we're looking at like, you know, calories, like I mean, I don't eat a ton, but I probably have high calories because I eat a lot of fat mm -hmm. as opposed to just eating a lot of stuff. Right. But it's the good fats, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and for some other people that might not make sense, especially if your liver isn't working. Mm -hmm. But again, that's also going to help the liver because we need the fats. I mean, that's the driver. It's the, it's the vehicle to bring nutrients into the cell. It lines every nerve in the body. Um, cholesterol. I mean, cholesterol is actually you know, a good thing because it's the body responding to stress. Now this is, I, I again, I, it's funny because you say something and then, I mean, I, I learned this years ago from a naturopath and then, you know, there might be opposing ideas around this, but it made sense to me. If you have high cholesterol, it's because you have a lot of it, um, areas in your body where there's fraying, you know, like if you've, you know, taken something and you keep bending it over and over again, it starts fraying. So it's kind of like you've got like What's little fraying exactly. Fraying is like um, separating. No, like, like really, what what in the body is? Well, fraying. I mean tissue, tissue. If if there's if there's an overuse, we get little speed bumps mm. or little potholes in the body, and basically the cholesterol goes and fills those potholes in. So if you have high cholesterol, it's because your body's requiring it mm. to help other things. So to then take a cholesterol medication to lower your cholesterol, mm. it's going against what your body's naturally doing. It's indicating that there's an issue, but the issue isn't the cholesterol. Yeah. The issue is the fact that why is your body needing to make it? Because you've got stress everywhere in your body. Mm. And then of course, now, if you think about that further and it is fat and you're, you're cold, now the cholesterol starts to cling on the, and stick on the inner lining of the blood vessels. And then we take even more space away. So then the heart has to work even harder. And then there's even less blood getting to areas, creating more problems to increase the need for the body to create more cholesterol. I mean, it's, it's so fascinating because what is really intriguing to me is how simple the body is when we just let it do its thing and we support it instead of trying to be smarter than what the body is right. and trying to fix the problems. Because if we just learn how to breathe and use our body and the way we were designed to use our bodies. Move. Don't, exactly. Don't be so stationary and sedentary throughout, throughout your day, throughout your life. Definitely move. Because even what you were saying, like you do need to create that movement to allow the carbon dioxide yeah. to, to come away. So that's where a lot of that idea behind calories in versus calories out, but it's, it's the breath is really that missing factor because sure, you have to move. That's, that's the movement, but 
your breath is the vehicle, as you always say, that's bringing that carbon dioxide out. And an important question to ask yourself is what kind of vehicle are you driving? Well, and what kind of movement are you doing? So my generation as kids, we climbed trees, we hung from trees, we played hide and seek. We were able to run around our neighborhood. Nobody was really worried or concerned. So, I mean, you were using your body in a very different way than today where, you know, kids might go and they may be playing a lot of structured sport. And then maybe they're sitting in front of a computer or they're on their phones or they're playing video games. But the movements, because they're playing sports more than just this random play, it ends up becoming asymmetrical in the body. So now you have a part of your body that's overused and part of the body that's used less. So we start to see these asymmetries. So where those adhesions are, I mean, you can go and you can be a tennis player, but you're going to have a lot of your body, if you're asymmetrical, which a tennis player would be, that are going to be blocked from flow because of how we've had to structure. That's why it's important to counterbalance that. Yeah. And that's why things like, you know, yoga and Pilates and martial arts where you're, you know, you're really working your body in general and, and then doing outdoor things. I mean, hiking, like you're using your body very differently when you're hiking yeah. or you're climbing um, as opposed to rigid play. Mm. And so... Even people that are high level athletes, if that, you know, if, if tennis is your sport, you're going to have a, a body unless you're aware of mm -hmm. that and you do things to counterbalance what that is, Yeah. then, you know, you're going to have problems down yeah. the road. Yeah. A hundred percent. I want to bring up <laughs> kind of one last topic, a little bit more for fun. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> but no, okay, it's, it's because, <laughs> it's because I did a video on this and it got spun around okay. where I was saying you can spot target fat loss. Okay. That's all. I, I, I kind of opened the can of worms there. Um, but it's, it's interesting because when you understand, because they will say in the fitness world, health, wellness community that you cannot spot target fat loss. And I totally get that. But if you are really compressed in certain areas and your fascia has migrated and you have that collapse in the low ribs and your belly's protruding or you're twisted to this one side then it's causing a ballooning elsewhere i would say to an extent you can absolutely fascia target areas 100 that can open up yeah. the flow so that you can put that space back gonna sound redundant open up that flow carry out all the garbage and rebuild it properly 100 percent agree Okay. Yes, you absolutely can. Um, and I think it's, it, you have to be really careful when you see that. Cause when I, when I said that on a video, if you're sure it's a TikTok, you have 30 seconds to a minute to get your point across and they spin it a, a, a different way. I wasn't saying you can spot target fat loss hundred percent, but I was saying you can, you can spot target fascia release where you can have that compression that's locking all of these cells. Well, and, and simple, you can do it with the feet because again, if you've got a pronation, that's going to create a knee joint that's going to compress and balloon on one side. You correct the foot structure. Mm -hmm. You take away that compression on that knee joint. Now that what they think is knee fat, it which is more than that. It's I mean, but fat is in there. It's just that ballooned area. Then you bring balance into that joint and then you pull that bulging and you bring it back into balance. So then what you think is fat loss or fat isn't. And yes, you can absolutely spot target that. You did that. You did that when you were training. And yeah. I mean, here you are, this beautiful lean body, but you even said, and I think you were only 18 or 19, and you said, there's this little tiny the bit little above. The little love handles. The little love yeah. handle. So we had you, you know, working just below in that TFL, TFL muscle. And as mm -hmm. soon as you stood up, you're like, holy smokes, it's gone. Yeah. Because you were held. So that holding pattern created yeah. a little bulging of the compression. You release that and then boom, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really cool how it works. And and you said a very important thing because you're talking about the knee or knee fat, but you actually talked about the foot. So I want to make this clear that let's say you have a big belly or you have a lot of, let's say, fat accumulation in your love handles, your low back or your thighs. Sure, you can work directly in those areas, but that still might not be the cause right. of why you have that excess buildup in that area. And we see that a lot with, um, you know, especially women, I think, that have that lower belly fat. Because if you look at the alignment of the feet, if we're properly aligned, the feet should literally be underneath the hip joints. And if everything is aligned correctly, the hip joints sit in the pelvis as they should be in their space mm -hmm. for everything. Where if you start to see how you know, one foot gets pulled away, the other foot gets anchored, that is now manipulating what's going on in the pelvis with the hips. Mm -hmm. So if the hips start getting 
pushed close together, just like collapsing the rib cage into the core. Now you're going to have a lower belly extending mm. outward. And not only that, that is going to start pulling the rib cage forward and down, which is also going to add to that pressure of the belly going outward. So people need to hear you say that again, like that. I just visualized all of that and it started making a lot more sense. You, you explained that really well, or I at least interpreted it into a way where it made a ton of sense. That's super, that is super interesting because you always say you have to work your foundation. Even if you are talking about pain, you have pain in your upper neck, your upper back or wherever the, the issue is, but it's the same thing for everything. It is. And it's for, for weight and fat because yes, if your foundation's off, the knee joints are off, your hip joints are so twisted and then they're literally closer together, then that causes a protruding belly because your hips are too narrow. They're not broad enough. Yeah. And then you've collapsed this way as well. All of these collapses collapse on top of each other. Yeah. That causes this absolute chaos in the body. Now people are asking, why do I have pain in all these areas of my body? Why do I have this extra buildup of fat or whatever you want to call well, it. Well, then you add things point. like C-sections and other like surgeries that are going to add even more scarring and injuries potentially and all of that. I mean, no wonder we are such a confusion in the body, right? It's again, like we can look at the body as a container with parts. That's confusing because as much as that seems really basic and simple, why does this like, why, why, if I have a heart problem and I address the heart, why am I not getting any better? It's because we're more than a container with parts. We are a fluid matrix where every single thing is interconnected. And if I took your hand and I wrapped around, you know, your oh, shoulder. Really took my hand here. <laughs> I did. So, and I'm internally rotating the shoulder, right? Yeah. I mean, look what, look what just happened to your shoulder. Yeah. And it's not because you've lifted your shoulder. And if you get a sore yeah. shoulder and you go and get a treatment, I yeah. mean, that's going to feel okay for a minute, but let go of the arm, let it yeah. fall back. And then suddenly it's a very different shoulder. Yeah. A hundred percent. Wow. Good call. Good topic today. Very, fun. very good topic. And it's a, it, it could be a very sensitive topic and I yeah. totally get it because there's so many opinions on it and there's a really powerful statement behind it from the fitness, health and wellness industry where it really talks about calories in versus calories out. And it's just been a lot of fun to explore more so our perspective on it, our opinion. Again, we're not scientists. None of this is 1000% scientifically this is our proven. Yeah. It's our experience and what we've seen with our community because what people say in our community and how it's helped manage their size and shape. I'm not saying here fat loss. I'm saying managing their size and shape and many of them have dropped many LBs on the scale. It's it's something that we can talk about from experience and from our community's experience. And what I love, I just last week did an interview with a scientist and he was talking about the this, this molecule that he pretty much discovered. It's a carbon molecule, but it's got a specific shape. And he, he basically, and he's a scientist. And he basically said like, you know, when it comes to science, everything in the beginning is anecdotal because how else are you going to even take steps to know otherwise? Mm. So you have a, an idea or something, or you come on it by chance and you see there's positive changes, then you start studying it. Right. And that's, I mean, that's everything in life. Mm. And that's the part where sometimes I, I feel frustrated because people have this idea of the body from so long ago. And it's like, well, no, this, this is the science. This is in the textbooks. It's like, yeah, but as we keep evolving in time and our minds keep opening up and expanding, there's new ways to look at things and there's new things to discover. So why are we stuck in this mindset without believing that, okay, well that might've made, and it still probably does make very much sense based on the paradigm of you're a body with parts. But when you start to understand there's more to it than that, mm. then there's more science to uncover. Yeah. And that's, what's very exciting now because now we're really starting very to cool. see this stuff again with this breath book with Gary Brecka. Um, lots of people are sending me all these things now about different breathing and people talking about it. And it's really cool. So I just want to share, cause I always, uh, it's great if, you know, the listeners can leave with something really profound mm -hmm. to help them, mm -hmm. no matter what you're dealing with. If you start with that diaphragmatic breath, you do that work between the toes with a pencil, three minutes between each toe. And then you stand and you grip, you're going to start changing the patterning of your fascia. You're going to bring life into the most Arctic region of your body. And that's going to be lovely. It's going to help to fuel that 
carbon dioxide at the extremities. And then same with your hands, you know, putting um, pressure between the fingers for three minutes between each, because again, the hands are frozen as well and starting to bring life to, again, the furthest regions from the engine. And then you activate the engine and then your body starts to change. So if you do nothing else, you can start that today. And if you do it every single day, I bet you'll be really excited in a few weeks, a few months, what's going to happen to your body. Yeah, totally. Love that. And you can, um, as we mentioned earlier, you can uh, follow that belly position on our YouTube channel, uh, understand how to breathe diaphragmatically, breathing in and out through the nose all the time if you can. Yeah. He even talks about taping your mouth shut yeah. a bit and it's like, hey, got to do what you got to do and breathing slow as slow as you can where you're comfortable now and then over time the more you practice it like anything that will improve and you'll be able to lengthen your breath and live in the exhale mm -hmm. you know try to make that exhale your comfort zone initially it won't feel comfortable it'll feel like you're you know drowning a little bit until you get used to that you absorb more oxygen you when do you exhale longer yeah so it's a, it's a practice and just start for a minute and just see how it feels and say okay that wasn't comfortable starting anything new is generally not comfortable yeah until you get used to it and until your body adapts. Yeah. But you'll adapt quickly because again, it's how we're meant to be. Mm -hmm. Wow, cool discussion. Yeah, that was fun. All right, well, let's wrap up here. Um, well, first of all, if you enjoyed this episode, that was a ton of fun. I always learned so much. Like it's the only time we really sit down and have these conversations is when we do this podcast, yeah. at least for this intense, for this duration. It's really, really cool, really fun. And it's very organic. Yes. Is nothing with our podcast is scripted, which is really cool. And some of it's like kind of planned, but not really. It's just very in the moment. And I love that. Uh, but anyways, if you want to learn more about us and block therapy, you can check out blocktherapy.com. There's some links below. If you're watching this on YouTube, get started with our sampler program for $9. You can check out our YouTube channel just to try out different and new positions. Um, of course, if you want to get started with block therapy, that's our block therapy starter package. Um, one other thing is the Facebook community group. People love going in there and that's where we have quite a few people in there now. Um, I forget the exact number, but great place. Go to Facebook, type in block therapy community, request access, start a conversation. Even if you just want to see what's in there, it's remarkable. People share their testimonials, amazing support. And other than that, uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. This is so much fun and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Bye everyone.